one of the founders of the Sacramento um, chapter. Uh, about four years ago, I um, got that started, and one of my greatest accomplishments is finding a, two replacements from uh, me as the group leader, and now I'm a Northern California Regional Coordinator. And my co-leader for this, these two sessions is Diana Russell, member of the Silicon Valley North. Uh, uh, founder, 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 co founder, right? Co founder with Tasha. Tasha and I the Silicon Valley North uh, chapter. So. Now it's quite well moved, too. Four, about four and a half years. Okay. Around the same time. Uh, so, welcome everybody to this breakout session. Well, the way I decided to kick it off is talk about where grassroots outreach, got grassroots engagement fits in with the five levers of political will. Who here has heard about the five levers of political will? A lot of you, but not everybody. So um, this is sort of standard, I would say, probably in organizing, but CCL talks about levers of political will. We use these five levers to move our members of Congress um, to our position and also move public opinion to our position. The idea is bringing the concern for the climate really to the center of accepted public opinion, I would say. So these are levers we use to do that. Uh, of course, lobbying, right? Directly lobbying our members of Congress, using media, social media, and traditional media, uh, letters to the editor, op-eds. Um, I'm going to skip here to grass hops. That's like your endorsements uh, for businesses and community groups, uh, resolutions from for state and other local government, um, municipalities, local governments. Um, and then, of course, underlying it all is the chapter development. So that's what supports all of our activities, um, our meetings, the admin that it takes, just personal um, education and enrichment and, and, and empowerment as citizen lobbyists. So grassroots kind of fits in um, in here. And it's more about, and I think that one of the things we can do is talk about what grassroots outreach or grassroots engagement really is. You know, we're going to be talking about the, the tabling event and, um, and speakers' uh, presentations. And that's more about person-to-person -person contact, informing people about our, our um, endeavor, and just having personal contact with the members of our community. I think it can tie into grass tops eventually because you are getting to know members of certain community groups. Um, but it's really about the person to person contact. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the five levers. And I guess we're going to hold our. We're going to talk about that. Right. right. So, we have three panelists who agreed to talk in the first session. Molly's going to uh, talk about tabling. Dave's going to talk about Speakers Bureau. And Louise is going to talk about events. And then in our second hour, uh, we will have another panel that talks about progressive or environmental justice, uh, conservative outreach, and then relationship building. So, and uh, two different segments here. Um, so we've asked the panelists to talk to you about uh, what what their best practice is, what they've found in uh, each of their areas, or what pitfalls they've found or difficulties that they've had. Um, and uh, to give you their insight for about 10 minutes each, we'll give you a chance at the end to ask them any questions. And then we'd really like to hear from you about what additional resources would be helpful and valuable to you in the local level? Like, should we do a regional network uh, development of some kind of regional resources to help you out in your individual chapters? Or what, what, what's the kind of help that you need? So we'd like to take that and build both of these sessions to kind of uh, come up with uh, things that we should do on a regional level to help support you. Can, can you restate the three things in the second session? Uh, environmental justice, um, progressives, uh, conservative outreach, and then relationship building. So, okay, so with that, Molly, can okay. you uh, tell us about your experience in um, tabling? Sure, and I'm going to try to stick with 10 minutes, right? Okay. Yeah, I like to talk. So, um, well, I'll just say I'm a, I'm a member of the Marin County chapter, and I've been a member for about two and a half years. I'm a former, I think I could say, retired educator, administrator, kindergarten through college. So. 
my experience uh, that I bring is is a lot of organizing. So I feel that you know um, that really really did help with with setting up some tabling. Um, but I just want to say I I would like to ask how many of you have tabled for your local chapters? Quite a few of you. Okay. So how many of you have not tabled? If you don't mind, just so I know who. Okay. And how many of you have used the webinar? Tabling 101 from the community website to prepare you. Okay. All right. I'll refer to that because um, I, I, I kind of have to laugh. I was, you know, they said they needed a tabling guru and somebody gave my name. And I, I was more like the reluctant tabler. So this is, you know, confessions of a reluctant tabler. But I'm, I'm flipped now. So, and I use Tabling 101. Uh, to learn how to do it, and you know, I figured if I could learn how to lobby conservatives from the community website, I could probably learn how to set up a tabling event. So, um, I, uh, I just, I think I'm not going to like read you everything from the webinar, but I would really encourage you to to take a look at it if you want to hit a lot of important, you know, um, details like why why we table, where we table, tabling resources. Um, preparing for the event, tabling best practices, suggested messaging, um, what to avoid, what you do, preaching to the choir, handling pushback, after the event, and key learning. So I'm going to try not to repeat all of that, but it's going to be kind of peppered, you know, through my what I talk about here. And I, do we have a photo? Oh, great. Okay. Um, I wanted to say this is not uh, this is the San Francisco uh, tabling event, which um, Jeff Whittington, the photographer, handed over and to me and said, you know, this is kind of a guerrilla approach. It's an ironing board, so it's the simple approach. You know, you can I guess you can even carry it on a bus. I, I don't know, but he mentioned how you know they have in San Francisco they tabled 25 times and 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 had 500 letters uh, to members of Congress last year. Um, they do big, big tabling events and uh, simple ones like this. I've only done, I guess my th main thing was a big tabling event July 4th, a while ago, and we learned from that, and I'll tell you what we think we're going to be doing from there. So um, that's a simple version, I would say. Oh no, this is our, this is uh, the, the setup for our event on July 4th, and you can see it's looks like it's at a ranch, which it is. It's the Woodacre Flea Market, um, which also includes a pancake breakfast at the fire department and a parade that's really down home, you know, families, kids, old cars, tractors, and that kind of thing. Uh, I lived in Woodacre for 23 years, so I was very comfortable setting up a table at the 4th of July flea market. For me, that was important, because tabling didn't look like a lot of fun to me, and I, I decided if we're gonna do this, one, it's got to be fun, or we won't have people coming back to table. We don't, didn't have a lot of tabling going on in, in Marin in the last couple of years. So um, we kind of brainstormed after lobbying in June. Um, I was pretty energized. I'd been a couple of times, and I had seen at the Climate March in Oakland, I'd seen the East Bay table, and I saw somebody doing it, and I thought, okay, I can do that. You know, so. Anyway, so uh, we made a last minute decision to try to do something on the 4th of July. So I was able to get us a free spot at the flea market and I knew it was going to be a high traffic experience because I'd been to that event many times. So that was my comfort zone was to do something where, you know, I was familiar. So you might want to think about that, you know, if you haven't tabled or where are you going to do it. I kind of figured it doesn't matter who the audience is to me, you know, we need to reach outside of the, um, the Earth Day events and, you know, we have a lot of climate activity, um, climate action groups in Marin, environmental action groups, so they know about us. They may not know about carbon fee and dividends, so we certainly need to table there, but I'm, I was starting to feel like, wow, you know, in Marin we can get kind of smug and feel like we're so together on the, you know, environmental stuff, but we really, when I talk to friends, they don't know about um, CCL. So. So that's one of my missions is to just get more name recognition, even if that's, you know, they just start recognizing it and then go into CFD if you have time. There, you know, all the purposes of tabling are listed. Um, 
on the webinar, but um, those are some of the, the reasons I just mentioned, getting the word out, getting new members, certainly getting supporters, but I also thought, you know, on-the-job training for new members and, um, and then getting acquainted with each other because we really still need to build those relationships from our experienced members with our new members. So um, I'm just going to say I think that I think really key is that something like this be fun and and, you, and there's got to be something that inspires you. So I'll try not to repeat myself too much on that. But um, since I was inspired, I thought, okay, I can do this. And uh, so how we set this up? Um, let me just. I, I put the picture up there because I wanted to not forget details, but I'm going to look at my list here. I, one thing about, you know, having been a teacher for so many years, if I'm going to put time into planning something, I, wanna, I want it to be replicable, and I don't want to have to gather all the stuff again together. So I decided I'm, you know, I'm going to get a schedule together, I'm going to do all this, but I'm going to make a kit so that whoever wants the table can, uh, you know, use the materials that we've put together. So, um, so, and I took advice from a couple of other people. Um, we knew it was going to be hot, 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 and sunny in Woodacre. So we had a shade shelter. That was pretty essential. I knew people were going to be thirsty, so we had water. Just some of those basic comfort things, but what turned out to be the draw was the shade and the water. <laughs> and you just don't, you just, you know, you know your environment, great. You never know what's going to draw people in, but that was one of the things. Somebody said, put M&Ms on the table. I wouldn't say, I would say, skip the M&Ms. Okay, um, my, my kid, if you're interested, I can, uh, I can tell you more, but I want to tell you a few things that um, I, we put out. Um, I, I brought materials so that our new people and our experienced people could refer to them if they needed to. So I printed out the Tabling 101 and put it in here. I put the schedule in here and everyone's phone number. I set up a schedule for four people at a time, two new, two experienced, so we had a team. That was really essential for us because we did have some hard questions. We mostly had fun. We mostly talked to a lot of really nice people. And the draw was, it's just interesting what, uh, you know, what drew people in. Sometimes it was, does your dog need water? Sometimes it was the woman on the Icelandic pony riding back and forth reading the banner. And I learned to watch people's eyes. So that's our banner. I got, uh, you can get the graphics on the website. Um, I wanted it to be affordable, so I went into Kinko's and said, I need it to be this size and, you know, 40 bucks. So that's what it cost. It rolls up. You know, it fits in my box. So um, that banner actually was visible, and I think that drew a lot of people in. And you could see their eyes if you wanted to, if they might want to engage. So we had some people stepping out to talk to others, some people just, you know, in the shade. Um, and we had, we were so busy the whole time that we realized next time we need more chairs, more water, etc. cetera. Um, I think my time's going to be up. Um, the day went really well, and what we are planning to do from that experience is we've learned one is advanced planning is really key because we could have done the pancake breakfast and we could have marched in the parade and so on. But it was a good learning experience, and so we are going to we have a team of three or four people now. We're going to be scheduling um, any possible tabling event on our Google Calendar <coughs> and start uh, working from there. So I have a lot more, but I'll stop right sure there. You, do. Yes. <laughs> you know we've constrained yeah. a lot. In the okay. Thank you very much. And so Dave's going to talk to us about uh, his speakers bureau that he has established. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for being here. We packed to the gills, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I appreciate. Uh, that Glad we're on a kindergarten. Home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm excited that you're here. I'm excited to be here. Uh, it was about. And about three years ago at the Sunrise Rotary Club. Actually, we can show the next slide if we can do that. Um, at, and uh, it was my first gig as a grassroots. Uh, we had our first group grassroots and I, and I was, uh, I had a lot of trepidation. And I was going to go. Get in front of people I didn't know. And, uh, and giving the pitch. Uh, it was about two minutes into that presentation, and actually I wasn't given the presentation. 
can see here, this is Tim Deck. Many of you know Tim. He's just a super guy. And the audience started to lean forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And about a couple more minutes, he saw the hand start to go up. So, uh, what was going on here? And the autos are made up of uh, insurance brokers, stay-at-home moms, uh, college students, veterans, you name it. Any of these people could have been my neighbors. And they were totally engaged. And um, when we finished up, we couldn't get out the door. And the reason was people say, had questions. There's a few of them come up and say, well, I'm a little skeptical about this kind of thing, so on. But a number of them said, thank you for what you're doing. And I was hooked. And I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> so my presentation is uh, really about what used to be called uh, Speakers Bureau. And three or four years ago, if you were interested in making a presentation on a climate, uh, you can put your name on the list. And of course, people put their names on the list, and nothing happened. <laughs> you know, phone never rang, so on. Uh, so I'm going to stop before I go on and ask any of you who've made climate presentations or been involved in any of those activities, raise your hand. Fair number. How many of you would like to? <laughs> OK, all right. And for the rest of you didn't put up your hands, I have a special job for you. It's called a scheduler. <laughs> because we've modified and put together, this is not my idea, but uh, the, uh, a tandem arrangement where it's a kind of front office or back office. And the front office is, is the people who do the presentations, the customer facing, the Tim decks. Not so soon, to... actually. Oh. Go back. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so if you're an extrovert, you're going to be a presenter. If you're an introvert, I've got a job for you. Make a scheduler. And uh, I'm going to share with you the best practices. Actually, they're not the best practices. I would call them the best learnings that we've had in the last several years um, from the Silicon Valley chapter north. And actually, there's a lot of crossover with Silicon Valley and south and up the peninsula and so on. And uh, I'll start with a scheduler because that's probably what people don't realize. And uh, the impact that we have in scheduling the events with local organizations, local community organizations, tons of churches, clubs, clubs, religious clubs, schools, you name it, <coughs> Republican clubs, Democratic clubs. The reason this is so powerful is something that uh, Dr. Sabine Marks, did you all listen, somebody listen to the national call? this weekend, she talked about something called social context. It means that you're going to move people when they're in a social group of their peers. Now, we've gone off to many other social groups, churches, uh, colleagues at work, the Rotary Clubs, environmental clubs, and you name it. But you're going to move them when you speak to them, and they see their peers react with the hands coming up. And there's a palpable shift in their attitude towards climate change. It happens every time. And it's so cool to see it happen. Because I'm sitting in the back watching that. And you can see this engagement, and you can really see that you're moving. So that's the elevator pitch. The um, scheduling practices, there's, there's training that you can get. Uh, Extensive information, and we'll, I'll show you a slide a little bit more for resources. <laughs> the important thing for the scheduler, the end of her, the back office, is to own the process. And uh, it's not only reaching out to the different organizations, talking with people, and making proposals for presentations by your speakers, but there's a whole set of activities that go along with that that can give you a lot of power. So owning the process. If you've been in business, you're the process owner. The second thing is that there's tools available. And uh, through the presenters, what's called the presenters action team. You, you go to uh, action teams and you go down to presenters. 
there's, uh, I'll show you in a minute, you can download a spreadsheet with all kinds of useful information how to get started, how to organize campaigns. I mention campaigns because it's important to think in terms of different groups. So what we've learned is that going to the Rotaries is the easiest one. They have speakers every week. If you send out uh, proposals, and there are proposals available that you can use and modify, you're going to pick up some of those right away. Uh, and be able to, and, and so it's almost like marketing campaigns. Outreach campaign, we do the rotaries and we do the colonies and we get a little bit more confidence under our belts. We may uh, go to a more conservative organization and so on, work our way up. Mentor your presenters. There's nothing cool than taking a young college student, send them over to do some tabling. <laughs> They start talking to the cup, and then you the, set them up with some slides and do some practice runs and watch them take off and fly by themselves. That is so cool. I love it. Okay. Uh, make tailored proposals to your prospects. Uh, go to the show. This is the show. Because you're sitting back and you can get the sense of how the audience is reacting. You can see areas for improvement. You can share those with presenters. Get references. Sometimes we book gigs nine months in advance. I think we're doing that with the Audubon Club. It takes forever, but if you get on the list, eventually they, they, they turn up on you. So be patient, be persistent. So those are some high-level learnings for, uh, for schedulers. Now the presenters. Okay. And we've been really fortunate, uh, partly through mentoring and having a panel of presenters that I can match. So we may have somebody who's younger, a millennial, go and talk to the students in the environmental club in San Jose State. If we're going to go to senior centers, hey, I'm ready to go. <laughs> it works every time. Okay. So uh, work in tandem with the scheduler. Uh, know your target audience. We have a very powerful deck, a presentation deck. It's a core, what we call the core deck, that you can load with your own uh, your own slides, and what I recommend is make it local when you're talking about climate change. <coughs> Anything you can do about talking what's happening in California or what is even happening in your backyard or your locality, that brings it down to earth for people. Tell your personal story. Show your passion. Let your passion take over. It's just going to work for sure in getting that kind of engagement. Um, blend it. No carbon fee and dividend and, and Remy Cole. Uh, blend climate hope with urgency. Use the seven plus or minus two rules, which is people remember seven things coming out of it, plus or minus two, and always have a good close. Okay, so I want to just tell you a quick two slides, and I'll let you go for, for a little while. Next slide. We do have a national support call for presenters and schedulers. This. Uh, 25th of January, we're going to have Brian Edling. He's a tremendous guy. Um, he's done climate talks all over the place. And uh, so he's going to have a position. Uh, he's going to have a presentation. And we're going to talk shop a little about presentation and scheduling. Um, and what he's learned on a road tour. And, and one of the things is don't just give him the facts. Mm -hmm. It's really about storytelling. OK, so I invite you to sign up. You can go on. The action teams and sign up for presenters. I'll hear about that if you do. Um, and uh, attend, and we have a monthly uh, support call nationwide. Second slide is that we have a resource page. It's loaded with useful information. It's got all links to training videos, core uh, decks, uh, specialized slides, etc. that you can take advantage of. I'm a part of that. I've just been a part of redesigning it. I call it the grassroots, or the Grand Central for grassroots presentations. And, um, and then in conclusion, this is a tremendous amount of fun. I get tremendous, just like tabling. It's an uplifting experience. Every time I come out of a, of a presentation, I, I, I just feel better about the world and, and what we're doing here at CCL. There's 400 and some odd presenters um, nationwide that we interact with, so you have a lot of peers, and uh, I welcome you to go for it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you. Okay. And now, Elise is going to talk to us about events, how to get involved, and how to get a seat at the table.
Hi, I'm going to stand because I, I thought we couldn't have slides, so I printed things. I'm just going to hold them up. Um, so uh, I'm with the Alameda County chapter, and we've done a lot of events. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of these just to give you guys some ideas that might spark something that you could do, your chapter could do. Um, and I'd love to hear if anybody has any like brilliant ideas. I've always loved to hear them because it gives us ideas about what we could do. So about two and a half years ago, we did a carbon pricing forum. Again, this is Berkeley. This is pretty wonky. <laughs> so Monday night in Berkeley at the David Brower Center, which is a big environmental center in Berkeley, we got over 200 people showed up, <laughs> and um, we um, we had standing room only for this. And we this event. So one thing I want to say about when you're doing events, it's really good to have other organizations co-sponsor your event. So. In this case, we did this with the Berkeley Ecology Center, Berkeley Climate Action, and the Brower Center donated their space. So this was one of the first big events that we did. And we started to cultivate relationships through doing this event, and we got to talk to people about carbon pricing. And at this point, I think a lot of people have not really heard about Citizens Climate Lobby. This is pretty early <coughs> on. So that's one type of event. Did you have a forum on, you know, on our topic, something related to our topic? We've also been doing um, presentations at the local libraries. This is a presentation we did, co-sponsored by the North Berkeley Library. We showed the movie Before the Flood, the Leonardo DiCaprio film. If you haven't seen it, it's great. <coughs> and it's a great tool. People really want a cameo. It's got Leonardo DiCaprio in it and everything. Really, another really good turnout for this. Um, the only co-sponsor here was the library, but they loved it. I went to, I just, I live across from the library. I went over and said, what do you think of this idea? He goes, love it, let's do it. So, and I think Julie here has duplicated that at one library or two? Just one. One library, and? Uh, yeah, Oakland Public Library. I have approached several other Oakland Public Library uh, places. And they all were, oh, yes, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, uh, again, it's uh, worked out very well. Yeah. Yes, it's a really easy thing to do. We did it on a weeknight. You do it on a weeknight. They have, you know, our libraries have meeting spaces. I think a lot of libraries do. Then last year on Earth Day, I called up the David Brower Center. I said, what do you think about doing climate event on Earth Day? They were like, yeah, we have nothing planned and we've been, we've been looking for something. So we partnered with 14 other env local environmental organizations and showed this movie again, again sold out, um, had a, a fair going on at the same time, we had speakers going on at the same time, the movie and an and and environmental fair. Uh, what I learned from this is that's too much going on at one time. It was like people were like too spread out. Um, but it was a great, I think the best thing for me that came out of this was like relationships, we were building relationships with other organizations that um, now know who we are and we know them on a first name basis and, and you know, here we are, it's, it's Earth Day, nothing else really was going on in Berkeley, so this was um, another event that we did. And then, how many people here have heard of the Solano Stroll? Okay, so big event, right, 100, 150,000 people come to this event. So we decided, our group decided we were going to have a table at the Solano Stroll, um, similar to the one that, you know, the little, uh, and we had our, our canopy and everything. We also made, we had a, we had a, we bought a wheel, and we had a, uh, questions related to climate issues, and people would come up, and people would win stuff, and um, so we did that, we, so we had a table there, I don't even know how many people we talked with. Um, and we also were in a parade, and uh, one of our members made us pom-poms, and we did climate cheers all the way down the Solano Avenue. <laughs> now, this was fun. I don't even know if we got any members out of this, but it was, we, it was an attempt to, like, reach out to the public in a non-climate-related event. And again, there's thousands and thousands of people that come to this. It took a lot of effort. I'm not sure. Brian, what do you think? Do you think we, this was worth doing this? Uh, it was very hot that day. But yes. But the parade was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Well, you say it was a lot of effort. What? Well, just, you know, we put this big booth up, we had, we had we got the wheel, we did the pom-poms. It just, it was a, it was a, it was a project of, you know, we had a good team working on it. Um, so that's another, another thing. So, um, then sometimes you can walk into other people's events, like this is the Berkeley Chamber of Commerce, they have a Sunrise Speaker Series. 
And I called up the Chamber of Commerce and said, we'd like to come talk to you. They go, oh, we have this speaker series. Why don't you come and talk to us? So uh, Lee Balance and I went one morning and we talked with the, uh, we talked with the um, <coughs> Chamber of Commerce, told them what they were doing. We got a positive reception. It was a little too controversial for them, supposedly, to endorse, although we're still working on that. But, you know, well, the point here is other organizations have things going on that sometimes they're looking for people to step in. So this event, we just said, they said, sure, you can come and do that. One of our new members um, recently, um, this is on the Facebook page, recently talked to the New Parkway Cinema in Oakland and showed the movie Chasing Coral. Um, I didn't go to this, but I heard they had a very good turnout. Right, Brian? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And um, this is another type of outreach event. I know Brian is now organizing a film series. Mm -hmm. um, again, there are so many good films. So um, it's one way to draw people in to talk with them, be able to talk with them. And, and in this case, it was also a fundraiser, not for us, but for um, uh, an ocean health related organization. <coughs> Um, last weekend, um, myself and um, Edith Thatcher from Sacramento, we went up to the Wild and Scenic Film Festival where 7,000 activists came up to see films about the environment. And um, once again, called them up, said, we would like to do an event at your activist fair this year. And they, four minutes? Okay. And they said, sure. And so we, we did that. It was absolutely great. Um, the, so here was a, here's what we did. The theme of this, the fair of the festival this year was grassroots, and so they asked us to do a presentation not on CCL but on <coughs> our methodology and how it could be used to promote any issue. We did that, but of course there was a lot of CCL stuff in there. <laughs> so that was a really good experience. This is the second time we've been at an activist workshop at the Wellness City <coughs> Festival. It's a real opportunity <coughs> to reach out to activists from all over the state. So. And then finally, um, the, the project, there's two projects that our chapter is working on right now. One is a, um, we're working on a forum with labor, um, labor and environmental environmentalists. We're working with a number of unions that we're going to be holding a panel because we want to hear from labor. Um, they're not always in alignment <coughs> with what we're trying to do, and so we're trying to form those relationships too. That's one panel we're working on. And then what I'm working on is for this coming Earth Day is um, the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. If you've never gone to it in Nevada County, it is the most mind-blowing four days. I mean, just incredible. And they have an on-tour program that, that nonprofits can use to, to <coughs> raise consciousness in their community and to raise money. So um, I'm talking with them now about taking the on-tour while the scenic festival of uh, scenic film festival on tour and showing it for Earth Day, the, the uh, other abbreviated version of it on Earth Day at the Brower Center. So again, we'll probably do a big environmental fair in relate in in uh, conjunction with it and partner with not just some other the, the groups right now that we're partnering with on this. Okay, here's something interesting: is the Downtown Berkeley Association. Um, they're really interested in this because they want to do this and expand it as a way to draw people into the downtown um, and the David Brower Center, Berkeley Ecology Center. Um, so there's, you know, again, oh, and um, uh, yeah, so, so I want to, yeah, I just remembered one other thing I want to tell you. Um, but anyway, this is a really, another thing that people can do in their community, this on-tour festival, if you have a community that you think is interested, these films are incredibly inspiring. I just want to back up for a minute to the labor forum and to a bunch of these forums. We have partnered a lot with the League of Women Voters, and they're very interested and have supported carbon pricing, particularly in the state of California. So they're a really good potential partner. And uh, all of these, the, all of these events that we do, we have our tabling committee going there. Rochelle and her and uh, Rochelle is the head of the um, our member engagement team. So we're always collecting names, collecting letters, um, you know, constituent letters. So we, we, we do these as a team and because um, we're there to get new members and get letters and engage people. So that's it. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Lady in the back. Yeah, I had a question about the movies and the licensing fees. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the um, DiCaprio film will allow you to show that film as long as it's in, a, in an educational kind of situation. Okay, great. I don't know about every movie. Mm -hmm. uh, the Wild City Film Festival, everything, they, they make all the arrangements for the films. Okay. Yeah. And you know, you didn't charge. We did charge. You charged and it mm -hmm. still falls under that educational? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, back here and then the middle and then over there. Uh, you may want to get one of those... Um, we have, we have a fortune wheels, which you bought, mm -hmm. but I can help you make. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you contact me afterwards, there's a couple of questions you welded. You need to go to a local hardware store, pick up some plumbing pipe, and just screw it together. But uh, I can send you the welded parts, mm -hmm. um, and you can put it together. And I mean, just the click, click, click sound, it just pulls people in. Oh, wow. yeah. 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 Have you presented specifically to high schools, and if so, what's been your experience? Mm -hmm. Have you the, presented to high school? Yes, we have presented in high school. And um, what you would imagine is the engagement and, and willingness to uh, uh, get involved with climate matters is appreciably higher at the high school level, at the college level. There is such a difference between the ages. It's, it's just natural. It's like falling off a log to get into a lively discussion uh, intelligent discussion. I'm just totally impressed uh, when we're able to get in there. It's not easy to get in there, by the way. And, uh, educators make their plans a whole year ahead of time, and if you miss the window of opportunity, about two weeks you miss it. You're in for next year. Uh, one one thing with respect to resources that would be helpful. Uh, so I'm based out of San Francisco, and one of the things we're always looking to do is uh, every month when we're planning our next set of tabling uh, events. Uh, we're always looking for things outside of like normal farmers markets or the, the like Sunday streets events that we're at every week. Uh, so if there were like some sort of centralized way where we could collect uh, possible tabling opportunities, uh, that would be really awesome. So that way, especially if it were a month ahead of time, so that way we could put things on the calendar and sort of have people plan around it. Uh, because one of the things is that I thought, Candace has a hand, so I'll just finish this and then I'll kick it to Candace who has thoughts on this, I'm sure. Uh, one of the things we found was that if you sort of organize things with an email last minute, it isn't very helpful, but if you, uh, the, at your monthly meeting, you put three or four events on the calendar for the upcoming month, uh, that has a, and then you send reminders on that, that has a much greater likelihood of having people show up and remember that. Good point, got on the list. Question up here. So with tabling, I've had people come up to my table and try to make a donation directly in cash mm -hmm. to CCL. Mm -hmm. Is this something you encountered, and how do you deal with it? <laughs> Well, all I can tell you is we put a jar out, <laughs> you know, because um, we were paying for all the the uh, handouts out of pocket. I just so far have done that. So we, you know, just put a jar out for, and said that's what it was for. I don't, there's, there's rules and I don't really understand them all about where you can donate and how, you know, you want to Well, what I was going to say is that not so much the answer of what you just said, mm -hmm. is that at our meetings we have started to, to we send a basket around at our meetings, and we're making donations at every meetings, and we now have enough money to for our tabling material and all the other things we're doing. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that. But well, you're about the people who show up are, I, I believe they're attempting to donate to CCL itself. So there's a... You have to send them to the website to do it on the website. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's what I'm doing. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So what do you do with the money from film ticket sales? We gave that, in this case, um, when I'm thinking about the Brower Center one, we uh, gave it all to the Brower Center. Yeah, we didn't use it for our own, because that theater costs like $800 to rent. So, and they were giving it just for free. So I just said to them, you know what, any money that we have from the ticket sales is yours. And we did all the ticket sales through Eventbrite. Yeah. Um, so to kind of piggyback on what John was saying about um, being aware of events for the following month, uh, I think specifically what we need is maybe some kind of collaboration between all Bay Area chapters for identifying events that would be good for tabling presentations, um, events, kind of piggybacking off of other events, because we've had collaborate, collaborative efforts on the Media Watch now, and it's going really well for us, and I think we could expand that to some other areas. Roy, did you set up something in Northern California? We have a Northern California event calendar set up that oh. we're using, and I don't know, we gave it to some other chapter. Maybe Contra Costa might be using it. Oh. 
Yeah. So we. Really it could be used a lot more. Okay, well, I operate San Francisco, so I'm going to be in touch with you so we can. So I can. Have that's what we set it up for. For this, that's just for that purpose. Right back here. Thank you. Question for Dave. Uh, I'd like to help our chapter with some uh, scheduling of presentations. I found on the website a, a webinar about basics and how to do it, but I could not for the life of me find the supplementary materials. He made reference to a, like a one hour deep dive on scheduling details and also calendars. And I couldn't quite see from your slide, where are those detailed uh, uh, extra can, resources? There's a blue box called training, training, and there will be videos as well as the slides. So uh, there's a long and a short video. Uh, let's see, there's a specific vid video on scheduling, it should be. And if it isn't, uh, we're in the process of just kind of rolling this new, new thing out. I'm the guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> you get in touch yes. with For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, there's CCL Community. Does everybody, does anybody not know about CCL Community? Amazing! <laughs> Great. Over there and then you're Me? Um, concerning the events, could you talk a little more about how to promote your events? Um, as an example, you know, last year we had a CCL specific event in Tracy. And despite substantial promotion efforts, two people showed up. Oh, wow. So you've had great success, apparently. And I'm just wondering, how do you get people to come? Well, we had the events promoted through the organizations that we partnered with. Um, we put it. We have a, a local online newspaper called Berkeley Side. We put it in there. Every, every it's like an events calendar for in Berkeley. It's a Berkeley events calendar, and we put it on the Ecology Center. Every events calendar that we could find, we put it on there. Community, um, not your events, <laughs> community <laughs> events. Calendar. Yeah, like the city. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if we did. I think we did posters for the DiCaprio event. I'm pretty sure we did posters for that event. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it might have been announced on a couple of radio shows because we did some outreach to, to get the radio, you know, on their events calendars. Um, so I think that that's how we got, I think that's how we got Brian. We, we put posters in a lot of cafes in the area, too. We gave them members. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> I know we get that contributed. Yeah. What, what did you use to draw people to the event? What was like, the event? It was uh, just the CCL, you know, presenting what CCL is all about. You yeah. know, it's kind of, it's in Tracy. We're, it's, we're new to the area. That's, use I imagine movie. it's easier in Berkeley. You what? know, use, <laughs> use a movie. movie. Yeah. Like the DiCaprio movie. Yeah. Chasing okay. Coral is free. Yeah. I don't know if you yeah, noticed, but Chasing Coral. Coral is available for free, and mm -hmm. um, they don't want you to collect money. But it's a wonderful, uh, it's it's a beautiful and sad movie, but it's... But you have to then you have to say here's what we're doing about it. We did postering and we called other organizations like churches and you know other civic organizations. We just told them about the event. Mm -hmm. And they said, Okay, we'll tell our people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not you need to have a draw. Yeah. You can't just be come to listen to us about CCL. We we never do things like that. We wouldn't do that. Yeah, also the co sponsoring thing I think is maybe mm -hmm. might be the key. If you can find co sponsors, yeah. 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 But that was, did they just see the movie or did you actually give a presentation afterwards um, or something? Well, we introduced, like, I'm trying to think, well, at the event at the library, we did a presentation and we and we tabled at the event. We were the only organization along with the library. Mm -hmm. And then I stood up and took questions, that, you know, said a little bit of questions. At the other event, um, we... Did we do a... If we did, it was a very... Oh, I know, every organization gave a little, like, one minute blurb on who we were mm -hmm. and then we had we had workshops going on out in a different room um so we did and we and when we show movies that we do take the, if we can we do a presentation on ccl although i have to say that's not always because like at this labor forum we're not going to really do a presentation it's all about build, hearing from them yeah. and building relationships so it depends on the event how you build the event okay robin and then how do you uh, get your films? And are they something that we can reach for? Well, share? you can get the films at the library. Right oh, for ten bucks, you can get a copy of that DiCaprio film right off of Amazon or whatever. You know, they're really easy to get. Um, also, the one we saw we saw um, this morning 
I showed it at our local theater, and they, they did it for free. We got 60 people to come. There, it that's what I'm saying. We had a panel discussion with yeah. 350 and some other members. It went over really well. There's lots of movies. There's Master of Doubt. There was incredible films at the, at the Wild and Scenic Film yeah. Festival. I mean, there's just so many films. You just have to pick one that's got... The thing about the DiCaprio film, people know Leonardo DiCaprio. They want to see it. I mean, so, you know, whatever, whatever draws people in. Oh, um, yeah, I was just going to add on that Chasing Coral event, um, there, the, at the local movie theater that was shown, and then I think there was like a 30-minute discussion right after that, and then after that, there was a gathering at a local brew pub with food that you could also pay for if you wanted, or just hang out and get your own beer, and that is where CCL was actually doing the tabling, and we just had like three of us there, and people were coming up to us and wanting to talk to us. Um, and that was a crowd like we had never seen most of those people there before and the Chasing Coral movie, a lot of the people there are divers and so like there are people who are coming from this whole other, you know, um, you know, group of people who maybe aren't already reaching out to CCL but obviously there's a built-in affinity there so, um, so it was a great outreach for us. We have time for one more question. Uh, one question, I'm curious, uh, on the tabling front. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of training, one of the things we've encountered is sort of people who might feel uncomfortable or they're like, I can't talk and have strangers ask me about this mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do any training ahead of time in order to make sure that people are comfortable with that? Well, I think that would be uh, good if you can work that out. This was, like I said, this was a last minute thing. So I said, this is on the job training, kind of like lobbying. You may or may not be prepared, but you're not going to be asked to do anything here not comfortable doing. So it was really important to have, we had some experts, you know, if we had, and and so some people just were, were totally comfortable even though they hadn't been trained and others sat back and watched, but that was what it was about. And I, I had copies of all the laser talks if they wanted on downtime to look at that. I had a copy of Drawdown. I had all kinds of stuff available. And, you know, yeah, I'm not sure you know, I think laser talks are a good way to prepare, but, you know, everybody's different. I guess advanced training's nice, but, you know, it's we don't always have time. I refer them to, you know, the, well, that's, that's I think, we, you just kind of do absolutely. what you can do. Absolutely. If you have a, one or two veterans on there and, you, and, and, and then people are brand new come on and, and they watch. And, and pretty soon and they're, they're pretty, doing it. Yeah. Pretty soon they're doing it. it yeah. Is, yeah, it's all, it's and I'll just, yeah, I'll just say one of the easiest things I think people had was to just have the, uh, the letters, uh, letters to your member of Congress available, mm -hmm. and just to say, would you like to write a letter to your member of Congress? Because they're reading Citizens Climate Lobby. And one woman said, oh, you're damn straight. Where's that letter, you know? So, I mean, that's the kind of thing. Just how do you get engaged, and if you don't know the answers, what do you do? I do want to yeah. emphasize that constituent letter, and we don't we don't have a copy of it, but they're available on um, the community, and they're great. Yeah. Yeah. And there's yeah. samples of other handouts that we yeah. used up there. And we, we always get one. people's names too. We make sure as soon as we get those names, yeah. they go on the list. And we have a local newsletter, and they get the national. Our chapter does our own newsletter plus the national newsletter. Is there any segment of Laser Talks that's focused on the economics of the of the program? Because yes. those are the hardest questions yes. that I get. Yeah. How much is the cost? Yeah. Yeah. They're subdivided on community by particular topics. So, okay, and economics is. Mm -hmm. really yeah, something else that was handy. I had a list of latest uh, lit the caucus members, mm -hmm. and that came up several times. So I could just say, and here you, you know, they said, well, who's on it? Well, here's the list, you know. Mm -hmm. So just things like that. So you don't have to know everything, but it's there. Just real quick. So just to verify, everybody who fills out a a letter. You take those things and send them to me. Not a letter. Not, a le not the not letter. Letter. Oh, the letters too? Okay, the letters. And we have a yeah, sign. Yeah, I just always wondered about whether people really realize that they're doing that when they well, ask sign the letter. Well, in my experience, <laughs> getting someone to sign the constituent letter is an easy ask if they're hesitant. Mm -hmm. People are always right, like, yeah. why, do you, why are you talking to me? Do you want some money? Like, leave me alone. Right. But once you get talking to them, they're like, okay, great, what can I do? Um, nobody. Not, not everybody wants to volunteer or give their time, but a letter is a super easy ask, especially for the new people who are uncomfortable engaging and like trying to win people over to something. And really just say, hey, how about you just write a letter saying We have a lot of people that sign a letter. It's a checklist, too. They yeah. don't have to write anything. 
But you're actually putting them on the mailing list? What, what, yeah. we, do, what we do is we yeah. take a yeah. film, we'll have about a couple <laughs> sentences, and then we'll say, if you want to be on our list, put on the yeah. address. Okay. And we say we need your address really because they have to know what congressman to give this to. Right. We, we have a lot of people say, I will. Oh, a letter, but I don't want to get on your email list. They, yeah. They're willing to do the letter, just like what yeah, you're saying. Good. As long as we don't yeah. put them on our email <laughs> list, it's kind of sad. <laughs> so, well, Brian just said, and I didn't remember, the letter actually says, you know, we will use your name. Right. Yeah. And we'll put it in our list. Yeah. So, yeah. But I'm not sure everybody out. reads the fun. I, we yeah, pointed it out to everybody who still went in. We mm -hmm. said, you know, if you can, you're going to be on this unless you don't fill that in. Yeah. And then you can always stop. You can always say, I don't want to, you know, get a letter after. <coughs> All right, thank you. It's a very great discussion. Thank you. So you can capture them if you have further questions or, you know, catch them uh, in between the other sessions. I know they'll be happy to answer any further questions. So and we'll have, for coming. And we'll have about five minutes before the next one, so maybe okay. talk outside. Yeah. Although, if you do want to look at some other resources, we do have them before. If you want to stay for the next panel. Yeah, if you want to stay. Yeah. We're going to put some on our group. All right, so I think we're going to get going with the second part of our Thank you. 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 Thank and we just had a really great um, hour yeah. just now talking about some of the um, nuts and bolts of informing public opinion about CCL and climate change. We talked about tabling, uh, presentations, and events. And so that's you know one aspect of uh, grassroots outreach or engagement. And now we're going to talk about just kind of the general topic of relationship building and some of the networking, the person-to-person the -person networking that can also go on when we're um, building the relationships with our neighbors, our community members, folks that we wouldn't normally necessarily um, encounter in our daily lives, and talk about more of some of the philosophical aspects of grassroots uh, engagement. And Marty's going to talk about her work with the uh, environmental justice community and maybe also the progressive community a little bit. You uh, kind of asked me to cover this mammoth territory, so yeah. I made a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so she's which I can by no means cover all of it, but I kind of try to put it in my brand. And Matthew's going to talk about some of his experience with um, conservative outreach. And then I thought that what we would do is for the last part is talk about some of our own experiences. Um, doing outreach or engagement with our community members or groups that we're working with. Um, and I can just start that off with some of my work that I've done in the Sacramento chapter. And then we can have some more group questions. So, um, if we can start. start. To begin. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to start. Marty Roach. I, I, I might blab too much, so just Wait, we'll time We'll keep me. you on time. You know, Introduce time so, so I'm with the um, Contra Costa chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. And I also am on the National Environmental Justice Team. And that team has two purposes. One is, is none of it's about bringing people on board to our policy. One is to um, work internally within CCL to educate about environmental justice and why some of those concerns tie into our policy and we should be more aware of the linkages between those two groups and how they're thinking, how we're thinking and how they're thinking. And then the other purpose is to build, to dialogue, build relationships, and be an ally. To environmental justice, so that's that's where we're at. So that kind of tells you a lot about my approach, and I'm going to back up. And this, and, and also, a lot of people could be sitting where I'm sitting, so you're going to just hear a lot about my experiences. And this is really complicated stuff to try to talk about, especially when we're talking about, you know, a huge swath of the progressive community. One thing I have going for me is historically that's where I've done my activism, so I felt like I kind of knew that world. And I got into CCL, and then I was trying to figure out how do I bridge these two worlds. Um, and I just want to start with the political landscape a little bit, because I think all of us know this. But you know, originally, there wasn't this polarization where in, environmental work and work for the climate was a left issue. You know, there, was a, there were a lot of Republicans and Democrats at one time, back around the time of Richard Nixon or whatever, where there was shared um, agreement that this was worthy. But we know that it became polarized and so what that did is it really did push people 
that are on more the left side of our political spectrum into blending their worldview about environmental work with their general left ideology views about the kind of world they want to create. So when we approach people that have a political understanding, I'm, I'm a person, I'm a progressive, or I'm politically oriented environmental justice person looking for people that are having direct impacts, they're, they, they've bitten off a bigger package of change now they want to see, and the environment's only part of it. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. And of course, um, this has um, problems and opportunities, you know, if you're depending on how you look at it. You know, it makes it more harder for people like us who have a policy that takes both sides coming together. But there's also some benefits for that point of view. So what happened when Trump came in? Everything just went on steroids, in my experience, in the communities I'm working with that are progressive in the left. And this is in the Bay Area with 350 Bay Area and the Sunflower Alliance and just a, a lot of different groups. And so there's heightened distrust, um, tremendous energy to fight and protect what, what we don't want to lose any more ground, and furthermore, we want to win now because there's a, there's a feeling that we, we're really at risk unless somehow we can win. So the thought of bipartisan, you know, the compromise, is like really forgotten by a lot of the people that I talk to that are doing more just straight progressive climate work. Um, so it makes, our, it makes the conversations even harder. And then we have to reinsert race into this too because that became intersected with all of this. And... Um, and, Could you say and, how so? Pardon me? How so? Well, I think with the, I think that the progressive movement overall is really sympathetic to what we've, we've seen through all the videos and what's happening. We have a heightened awareness now of the racism that is in our society. And the left community has embraced that and supports Black Lives Matters and supports all of that. So again, when you're talking about people that care a lot about the climate, but they're also carrying all these other things they really care about, and it's all one big package. Race is now really elevated again, really high, and sensitivities about, you know, white people, a white organization, you know, who's in your group, you know, all those things tend to play out a little more extremely right now because the sensitivities are so high. So that's just a little background. So, Martin, just I, yeah. Also, I think it's really important for us to know that the people who are going to be going to be hit hardest and first are people of color, both in our country and internationally, and I think we really need to. Thank you. It was on my paper and, and I didn't even and say it. Your yeah. military. Mm -hmm. Your military families. They're losing their mommies and daddies. They're losing the parents. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're dying. But I mean, I think there is there is work. I mean, I think us as a primarily a white, um, middle to upper middle class organization, we have to be really aware of, of the privilege that that mm -hmm. radiates mm -hmm. out to, mm -hmm. to other groups. And it doesn't mean we have to... Um, be ashamed or try to explain it away. We just have to accept it and be aware of it and understand what that means when we're talking to groups, you know, like I work with No Coal in Oakland, meeting people in West Oakland that have very different life experiences. They're, they've, they've come out of a very different world than, than I have and they have different resources, both time and money, that they can commit to doing the community things they really care about a lot. So there's, there's differences there, being sensitive to those. So um, I, I divided it into three groups, and I'm not going to talk, I don't, I mean, I mainly work with environmental justice groups and progressive climate action, but I think it's important to pull out progressive climate action people from just progressives in general, and I know there's a lot of people that are working with progressive caucuses of the Democratic Party and different groups, that, you know, that have a democratic agenda, but I, I really see that there's three different groups there, and I'm not going to say anything more about that, but maybe we can discuss that more and hear about where people are working in, in those circles. Um, so when we think about how we do our work um, to engage with individuals and groups, and I'm going to talk about, um, well, I was going to tell you what I'm going to talk about, but I'm already in point three, so <laughs> um, I forgot that piece. Um, so how do we engage with individuals and groups that fall within these three broad categories? And in my experience, what I had to ask is, what is my role in relationship to those groups? I mean, how am I coming coming at them? And it really became apparent, outreach is not a fit. I mean, so I connect to these groups by engaging, networking, um, working in alliance. I'm a member of No Coal in Oakland. I donate money. I show up at their events. I consider myself working with them, and I'm an ally there. 
um, with uh, some of us, I don't know if there are any of the rest of us, well, Robin's in the room, the Sierra Club action we did. So um, this was, you know, Sierra Club does not have our position nationally. They don't support the dividend. They, um, they, they are not on board with our policy. But we made connections with the climate and energy team of the regional Bay Area Sierra Club. And so the opening there was dialogue. And so we were invited into one of their meetings, and Robin and I went with um, Tony Serna, and then Bob Archer was also there. And it was really an opportunity to, to give a little more detail on our policy, to dig down a little deeper, um, but, with no, but not in an advocacy sort of way. Just saying, we just want to lay it out a little bit more deeper and get some feedback, get some reactions. And it just had a very um, different feel, and we hope that the next step is going to be a broader dialogue, uh, Sierra Club wants to work with us in bringing more groups together, just to talk about some of the different preferences for how to put a price on, on carbon. So that's an example of um, just dialoguing, you know, just saying we want to we want to dialogue. We don't really have any expectation we're going to change your mind, but there's value if you understand a little more deeply the pieces of our policy and why we think it's important, then we want to hear the same thing from you. Uh, so, you know, the, I'll just back up and say, you know, you really do have to know the group you're going to talk to. Um, it really helps to, to know your audience. Yeah, I have five more minutes. I'm not going to say a whole lot about that because I think that's really basic communications 101, but I can tell you it was very humbling for me and I still feel in terms of environmental justice groups, you know, the first thing I did is learn the history of the environmental justice movement. Network, researched a lot of the national leading organizations in it, and it helped me understand the local groups that I wanted to start to get to know by understanding this broader world that they're in. Um, so who's the best um, messenger? Uh, and, and I think that people that are part of the same value system or subscribe to similar beliefs as the, the groups that you're approaching are really the best messengers. So. Um, and, and then there's also the concept that I just want to bring up is hats. Um, I wear, I'm a climate activist. That's my first and foremost identity here. I wear the CCL hat probably more than any other climate activist hat I wear, but it's not the only one I wear. I, I do work, I lobby at the state level for 350 Bay Area. I do some actions wearing the Sunflower Alliance hat. I wear many climate hats. And everybody that gets to know me in these different worlds knows I'm also CCL. So I feel that brings a really important message about that CCL um, people can be brought that way. Now, some people just wear a CCL hat, and so that's, that's a choice you're going to make, how many hats you wear. I think a lot of us wear more than one hat. And i just like to say um, there's a paradox about working in our lane, because I think with these groups, paradoxically, we can be more effective in our lane if we're working outside of our lane. What I mean by that is I can be more effective being an advocate for citizens' climate lobby by the work I'm doing in NOCO in Oakland than I can by knocking on the door and saying, can I make a presentation to you about carbon fee and dividend, and you should really care about this policy. Which brings me to my final point, since my time is running out, is that um, these people are not living carbon fee and dividend. It's not real to them. I mean, there's no bill. They, they haven't gotten a taste of it the way we have and taken this dive. So um, it's very abstract, and it allows people that are progressive the luxury of falling back on their ideology and their values and following some of the general critiques that are in the, the progressive media of our bill. And it's not until we have a bill in play that the real conversation is going to come, and hopefully we'll have really solid relationships with these people, and they'll know me as Marty Roach. Oh yeah, she's CCL, but she's also no Cole no Oakland, and oh yeah, she did that thing. Then when we have to say, guess what, there's a bill in, these are the pros and the cons of the bill, what do you think, can I come talk to your group about it, this is the time you're going to have to choose. But I think right now it's really abstract, so for us to push too hard on these groups um, to come on to our bill really backfires. And let me just say the final thing on that is that, um, how did I want to word this? It's, it's like we're reaching people like us who are doing mission-driven work on the climate. So they're our peers, they're our colleagues. So um, we're not bringing them an answer that's going to rock their world. They've already picked the answer that's rocking their world. 
we, we need to show mutual respect and, and to seek to understand why they're choosing to do divestment, why they're choosing to work on frontline communities to shut down a pipeline or mm -hmm. get a refinery to reduce its emissions. Um, they're, they're, they're in parallel lanes to us. It's very different to do this work than to reach out to the Rotary or a medical society or something else. These are people just like us. They're in the climate movement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. So we're going to have a questions till the end. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end of the session. So with that, Matthew, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Matthew. I'm a member of Silicon Valley East Chapter over in East San Jose. I'm also a member of the Conservative Caucus. I want to start off with a thought experiment. I want you all to imagine, 18 months from now, we've had the 2018 election and it was a wave election. Democrats take the House, they even take the Senate. Yes. <laughs> and, then, and then they take that first opportunity to pass climate change legislation. And it's huge. It's a huge victory. And just like Obamacare, it's a huge rallying cry for the Tea Party for the right. It's a gas tax. It's a grocery tax. It's the left growing government so that they can exert more control over the economy. And then all of a sudden, Republicans wave back in, Trump campaigns against and gets reelected, and then they start chipping away at it again. Right? Just like with Obamacare, where there was an attempt to repeal Obamacare, and then chipping away at Obamacare through repealing the individual mandate. CCL needs conservative buy-in for this to have longevity. The CCL plan needs to be in place for decades. It's based upon predictable cost structure for carbon. And the only way for it to work is if it's in place and everyone's bought in, we all trust that it's going to happen. Conservative outreach, conservative support for a proposal is incredibly important. It's essential to it. Critical. Critical, yes. This is why it's important for us to have a conservative caucus. This is why it's important for us to have conservative outreach. Now there's two reasons, two aspects to this that are very important. The first is having conservatives in CCL. And the second is building relationships to conservative groups outside of CCL. I want to start with conservatives inside CCL. It's very important that CCL is a nonpartisan group. And it's very easy to say that we're nonpartisan and then to snicker about the latest Trump tweets. It's very easy for us to say that we're nonpartisan and then complain about the latest actions in Congress. It's very easy to do these things, but as we do these things, we alienate the conservatives among us. What we want, ideally, is for us all to understand that the climate is a nonpartisan issue, a truly nonpartisan issue that rises above all the other important things that we care about so deeply. But because climate change is so important, we're going to set those things aside. Ideally, we'd look around this room and we'd see 50% of the people wearing red Make America Great hats. We want this. This is important to us. This is essential to our mission. So it's very important for us to remember these things in our interactions, in our meetings, in our outreach events, if you're tabling, whatever you're doing, to remember that. The other issues are important to you, yes, but they're not part of uh, that laser focus we have in CCL. So a big part of that is trying to grow our conservative caucus. One thing that I like to do when we have new members come to our meetings is I introduce myself as a member of the conservative caucus. And you get an immediate reaction. People might be interested, they might not be, either way. But some people will say, oh, I'm interested in the conservative caucus. I I have some conservative views on the economy. Great. Do you want to learn more? I can tell you more about us. Bring people in. Grow our numbers. That's a great way to build relationships and also build engagement. Because when people show up at CCL, they want to get involved. So we want to be welcoming and show them that this is some way that new members can get involved. And then as we grow the conservative caucus, that's important because that's to the second part, which is reaching out to conservative communities. This has to be done through trusted messages. I want you to imagine some, some policy issue that you have a strong opinion on. Maybe it's gun control. Okay, maybe you have an opinion on gun control. 
And maybe somebody from the other side of the political spectrum comes and tells you that they, you should change your mind, and they try to tell you why. You're not going to be swayed. You're not going to be interested in hearing their arguments. Same way, if, you, if we have uh, people who are very progressive going to Republican groups and saying, hey, here's why you should care about climate change, they're going to be automatically dismissive. It's not going to work. It's not going to be effective. It's why it's so essential for us to have conservative members in CCL, so that we can have conservative members do the conservative outreach. And I want to tell you a story about this. This wasn't one that I was directly involved in. This is experience that, I, that was passed down to me. And it's related to the previous session. Dave Kane was talking about his public speaking work. And you mentioned Tim Deck as well doing public speaking. Tim and Dave managed to get a speaking engagement with a Republican group in East San Jose. Fantastic. So they went and they gave a speech. And when they got there, they found that the Republican group had scheduled an opposing speech. And it turned into a debate on the science. And it wasn't a productive meeting. Dave tried to switch it over to the policy, said, yes, yes, we have skepticism on the science, that's fine, let's talk about policy. Did their best to do it. But by just going and talking to people and saying, look, this is market-based, you should like it, it's not enough. You need to build the relationships. And that's what we're talking about here today, is the building the relationships. So Dave and I have taken a different approach. We go to the monthly central committee meeting, GOP meeting, for Silicon Valley. It's open to the public. The schedule's on the website. You just show up. You meet people. There's maybe 20, 30 people there. And they say, oh, there's somebody new here. They shake your hand, tell them who you are. You say, you know, I'm inter interested in, in conservative ideals. Also, I'm interested in climate change. You talk to people about it. First time you go, you can actually ask for a speaking slot. At the end of the, so the Santa Clara County GOP, what they have is uh, an open floor at the end where anybody can stand up and speak for one to two minutes. So we told them we were going to do this. That time came, I stood up and introduced myself. I'm Matthew Stevenson from the Conservative Caucus at CCL. Here's why I think that the Silicon Valley GOP needs to start thinking about climate change policy. I didn't talk about science. People are skeptical of science, that's fine. It doesn't matter. What matters is, Silicon Valley GOP wants to be relevant in elections. And look, here's the polling showing that climate change is important to voters in this area. Here's how it's even more important to young voters in this area. Here's how it's important to people who lean to the right in this area. Here's the influence that the California State GOP was able to exert on cap and trade. Now's the time for the Santa Clara GOP to get involved. We don't ask for an endorsement on carbon fee and dividend. We don't ask for endorsement of CCL. We say, here's climate change. Here's a market-based solution you could consider, and it's important to your voters. And we start to build those relationships. The chairman of that committee, his name's Bob Nunez, he sits on the Milpitas City Council. And afterwards, he came up to us, very interested. He said, can you come to the next Milpitas City Council meeting? We're going to talk about community choice energy. Do you know, everyone here know community choice energy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he wanted us to come and give a conservative argument at the city council meeting in favor of community choice energy. Because he wanted that, that vocal support so that he could vote for it. Well, great. So we showed up. Okay. So we showed up. I stood up at the podium during the time, and I said, I like markets. Consumer choice through markets is great. It's win-win. People get to make those choices, personal choices, what's best for them. And at the same time, we can see through other communities that it also helps the environment. It helps everybody. Right? And Milpitas is moving forward with this. This is great. We continue to build a relationship. Bob Nunez is now running as mayor of Milpitas. If he wins, we'll have this already ready-built relationship with the mayor of Milpitas. This is fantastic. And you just keep going every month. Every month you meet people. People come up to you and talk to you about it. They want to have conversations. And it just, it just continues on. It's, no, it's not a big push. We're not looking for an endorsement. We're not looking to change people's minds overnight. We just want to build those relationships. Slow and steady. Make friends with people. 
right? After the committee meetings, we go out for dinner. We just go to a local pastor restaurant. We sit down there and just chat about whatever. All we're doing is just building those relationships slow and steady. You build that visibility, people become more familiar with CCL. Maybe now the Silicon Valley GOP goes to the statewide meeting and maybe they, they're more open. Maybe our delegates are more open to climate measures. It's just slow and steady building those relationships. It's, it's fairly straightforward and hopefully, hopefully it can also help us to bring in more conservatives into the group. And then it can snowball. Once you have more conservatives in our group, then we can start to do more outreach, build more relationships, and keep it going and build that political momentum. So that's what we've been doing in the South Bay. And uh, during the question period, we be happy to talk about more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I thought what I would do is talk about my experiences with some relationship building kind of in similar areas, actually in Sacramento, and then maybe we would spend a little bit of time, uh, just the 10 minutes that I had scheduled for myself, hearing about your experiences, and then we would go into the, uh, the Q&A and the um, ideas for, for what you might need in your work. So um, I started out with the Sacramento mm -hmm. chapter, and we are a pretty interesting area because we have it, the, the, the Sacramento itself, we're the capital you know, of the state, so there's a lot of... Um, policy people, um, and we're also a very blue central core of the city, and then we're surrounded by uh, conservative uh, counties. And so part of this work that we do is, well, who do we want to talk to in our community? Who are the people that we uh, want to build relationships with? And we decided that, well, the first go-to uh, is the Environmental Council of Sacramento. So we, be, as, a, as, a, as a chapter, we became a member of the Environmental Council of Sacramento. We have a person who goes to their board meetings um, and kind of represents us, and we go to their general meetings, and we table at Earth Day that they host every year. And uh, actually, I won the Environmentalist of the Year from that, that organization last year. Um, just from showing up, tabling, and talking, and, and it, the showing up. Going, going to events where you see these folks, you know, and um, I was kind of surprised. they ha And they haven't endorsed carbon fee and dividend. Um, there's a lot of folks who don't necessarily agree with the dividend. It's, you know, sort of progressive left in general um, organization. But they recognize the work that we're doing on the climate issue. So we have established those ties. Then on the other, um, it's not really the other side, but another area is the Metro, um, Sacramento Metro Chamber of Commerce. We also became a member of the Chamber of Commerce because we decided we wanted to reach out to the business community. And so I seem to be the one who's most interested. I, I guess I'm an extrovert. And I have been going to the mixers and having a lot of fun talking to people and expanding my comfort zone. So some of this is also expand. You, you, you can go to the places that you're normally allied with, and that's fantastic, kind of what Marty's done. Um, and what you've done is going to you know, your ideological sort of um, place where you like to be and talk. But um, for the, me, the Metro Chamber of Commerce was kind of outside my comfort zone. And I've really enjoyed that. And I show up to the mixers, and then they actually have a policy. It's, it's a pretty big chamber of commerce. And they happen to have a policy committee, uh, several policy committees. And then they go to a lobbying um, trip in Washington, D.C., and they meet our regional members of Congress. So actually, last year, I got onto the Air Quality Policy Committee, and I went with them to the, um, their cap-to-cap -cap, uh, lobbying trip in Washington, D.C. And I wasn't advocating anything CCL-related or climate-related. It was just about build networking, um, letting them know who I am and what I'm about, and not pushing our agenda. And this year, I'm hoping um, to have a climate-related 
policy <coughs> platform in, at the Air Quality Committee, but it's not going to be, you know, in support of carbon fee and dividend. Hopefully it'll be something like we ask our members of Congress to join the Climate Solutions Caucus or something like that. Um, and I'm hoping to go this year again. So it's kind of an example of what uh, these folks have been doing, but also, you know, stepping outside of my comfort zone and talking to some folks that I'm a soil scientist and uh, business and, and that area is not really my um, normal milieu, uh, but I actually have found that I like it. And uh, that's another thing is what, what do you get jazzed about? Who are the people that you want to reach out to and, and, and truly, you know, want to connect with? Because it's not about advocating to people who maybe you don't necessarily share their values, but about finding shared values. And we know that's a core CCL value. So I think we have about five minutes. And maybe just if anybody has any experiences they want to share in this vein about building relationships. So um, I've had a couple of conversations with libertarians. The first one was an unfortunate one where they, he pushed my buttons about denialism and it destroyed their relationship. Um, but I've gotten quite a bit of interest from libertarians who are kind of agnostic about denialism or you know what the causes of climate change are. They're more interested in the economics of it. And I find myself trying to make an argument that it's, it's an economic opportunity, not a cost to the country. And that seems to really resonate with them. Uh, I don't know what uh, what organizations they're in. Most of the libertarians I know are not really politically active or aligned at all. They're kind of disconnected. Um, so I don't know where to go next. So there's a national organization called Young Americans for Liberty. And they have chapters on a lot of different college campuses. And they do target undergrads. And we've had at the national level some discussions with uh, their leadership as well and you really do see the younger conservatives more concerned about climate change mm -hmm. and in this group as well at their upper levels they're concerned about climate change and what they're really interested in is market-based solutions uh, you know even being a libertarian minded person I still understand that some involvement in the market is necessary to avoid the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. But if you can do it in such a way that it's minimally invasive and still allows the market to do what the market does, that it can still be attractive to libertarian-minded people. In my conversations with uh, individuals at the Republican Party meetings, we do see a lot of skepticism on the science. And we just don't engage on it. Right. We just don't. If somebody tells me they're skeptical about the science, I say, awesome. Healthy skepticism is healthy. That's fine. What we want to talk about is risk mitigation. And risk mitigation to the economy. I don't consider myself to be an environmentalist. The reason I care about climate change is because as sea levels rise, the cost of worldwide shipping is going to be incredible. There's an incredible risk as the port of Oakland gets inundated with sea level rise. The port of Long Beach in Southern California ports in all these developing countries. The cost of the world are going to be immense. This is an immense economic risk. And even if you think that there's less than 100% chance that this is going to happen, that chance is still something you need to balance against the risk. So there's still an expectation of a certain amount of cost that needs to be borne by people who are emitting the, the, the carbon dioxide. And that's happening right now. And I might just add that, you know, you said that you end up destroying a relationship. And of course, well, probably a lot of us have had these things where you get into a, a headbutt. And of course, what CCL is answer, what we've been trying to learn is, is that the answer to that is to listen to what their concern is. It's possible that if you listen, what really is bothering you, you know, about what I'm saying, you might have possibly gotten to the idea that he is concerned about free markets, you know, or... Um, he was concerned about the cost to the economy. Of, cost to the economy. Of, of just doing green energy versus fossil energy. And there you that's, go. That's, and, that, that was it. and that's where you can really start to say, well, you know, start from there. Well, what are your concerns? Mm -hmm. Are there other experiences before we go maybe into Q and A about? Um, yeah. Well, I, I want to just uh, as, as we find common ground, I think what you're both saying is 
there is a language and way to speak to people that you are connected to. And what works for you in the communities that you're connected to isn't going to work for the groups that Marty's connected to. And we and one of I think the, the benefits, the wonderful thing about CCL is we can find our slices <coughs> of, of where we connect. I particularly and I'm a psychiatrist, so I am working on developing an understanding of mental health impacts of climate change so that my profession understands the health risks and using that in a broader health. It, it has nothing to do with lobbying Congress at this point. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that, that I'm hearing from both of you is that there are stories within the groups that we connect that um, are important. When we get to the questions, I'm going to have some questions for you about what the Bipartisan Caucus is doing that I'm struggling with. I think also, I, I think those um, connections need to be authentic. And, and that's what takes some yeah. time. Or, you know, I could give you examples of my conservative relatives, Texas, North Carolina, Norfolk, Virginia, where the tide's rising. We have, we have things we can talk about, but I found, you know, I have to, you know, it's really, it really is about an authentic relationship. Right. And, and I, so, yeah, so when I was going to Oklahoma to lobby, I called my niece, who's a student, PhD, political science student in mm -hmm. Oklahoma, conservative evangelical. Republican, and I said, what would you like, you know, I'm going to be there talking to your reps, you know, you want to tell me anything? So we had a connection there, but it was a trust, you know, there's a trust there. So I, I just think that authenticity is really important, and I don't go chasing people if I don't have, you know, I, I, I just can't. So. Um, well, I think another thing that helps is being someone who's on the conservative Republican side is meeting them where they are. Um, I think a big piece of advice I could offer you is understanding the frustration that a lot of conservative Republicans feel being in California and addressing those frustrations and saying, you know, mentioning like, hey, I understand that you lose a lot, if not all of your political battles in this state, but here's a winning one. Let's address, you know, market-based solutions and climate policy. Let's allow you, the consumer, to make choices. Let's address something that affects you and your families for the future because that's something we can agree upon. Because one of the challenges that seems to happen is that when the talks of climate change policy come along, it's like government and science and all these other combative things are projected upon conservative Republicans and they automatically shut off, regardless of what you're bringing to the table. So the advice I would bring is don't go in there with the presumption that you're going to try and change them. Go in there with the presumption of, hey, here's an issue. You have your way, I have my way, but this is an issue that affects us all, and this is an issue we need to talk about for the future, and here's how it affects us. Do you have an experience that you want to share? I identified progressive. I was born in Berkeley. I was raised in a Quaker family. Mm -hmm. I married a military officer. I have no success with my progressive friends on CCL. My conservative friends, they are on board. I am floored by how upside down and backwards it is. They perceive me as a conservative military wife who worked with a husband, was in intelligence, we trained at CIA headquarters. You do not realize how much your military family is on board with this issue because they are dying for oil. Mm -hmm. yeah. The difference between what the conversation is, is whether or not they perceive CCL as a threat or freedom. If you can explain it in terms of right now you have no way to make your daily buying choices, your power, your, as you, you don't have any way to affect the way, kind of world you want to live in. What's money for? Money is a vote. It's how you vote for the world you want to live in. If there was a fee on carbon, every time you or people you knew bought something, they would be able to more accurately reflect the true cost of polluting our commons. Mm -hmm. So if you could sell it on the basis of this empowers you, this is freedom, this gives you choice, mm -hmm. instead of my, my 
liberal progressive friends say this is covert coercive I'm losing my freedom I won't have choice there's gonna be a bureaucracy it's gonna dictate to me it's so backwards from what I thought it was wow. if, if if you yeah. can think of it in terms of this is freedom, this is choice, as opposed to right now, you have no vote. Mm -hmm. You can't have any impact. This is going to personally empower you. So are you having success with your conservative friends and, and families? I'm shocked. My, um, I know a lot of people in the South. I've gone to a lot of Bible study meetings. I don't, that's, I don't identify that way at all. But that is my area of influence. I'm able to talk to them and say, what does the book of Genesis say? God gave us this earth in stewardship. We have to take care of it. They're on board, mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. If only they could have more impact. It's really interesting how mm -hmm. upside down and backwards it is. For the last two years, when I first found out about this organization, my Christmas letter, every single person on my Christmas I joined CCL this year. Let me tell you what it is and how you can find out more about it. Wow. You're great. Chris, I'm going to add that to our research. <laughs> that's our research. <laughs> Christmas letter. Okay. Talk, to, talk to your military families. Wow, no, you know yeah. somebody in the military. Yeah. They're not political. I guess, yeah, to bounce with what she said, find issues that uh, stick and are popular with people and then kind of use those issues within their respective settings. Okay. You know, beyond, you know, like uh, the conservative libertarian setting, you know, the free market approach, personal choice, limited government, like those are selling issues that you can win most, if not all, conservatives on. And then I'm, I don't know. You don't even have to win. There's no win loss. They're already there. They're on board. Right, right, creating this sense of familiarity. And I'm sure there's those terminology in the progressive liberal area, but that's, that's not my particular area of understanding, so there's I wouldn't know where to start. Increasing rigidity, I think, right. from the progressive side to both markets, yeah. distrust of markets, mm -hmm. yeah. the, 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 the assault on government, yeah. mm -hmm. um, the regulatory rollback. Mm -hmm. So all those are, those are values are being violated. And then, of course, the dividend is a tough sell. Again, we, with SB 775 here in the state, we saw that a lot of progressive green groups and environmental mm -hmm. justice groups came on board for pricing carbon. Mm -hmm. So that's why my belief is, when, when it's theoretical, there's a lot, we get a lot, I get a lot harder lot. <laughs> but I think once we saw with SB 775, all these groups came on board. They might say, we're holding our nose, but we're there. We're going to lobby for this bill. So. Another experience? Uh, uh, no, I, I have a question. Okay. Maybe we're done with the experiences. Okay. So, but just go to open now. Uh, yeah, conversation so, and questions. My question is, what percentage of CCL are conservatives right now, and what, uh, what kind of success is your group having in terms of attracting new conservative members? CCL does, I believe, an annual survey of membership, political views of membership included, and I believe we're at about 10% people who express conservative views. <coughs> does that tend to be populated geographically where you'd expect it, or is that, or are there some surprises? I don't really answer that question. <laughs> is your chapter question. being, are you able to, are you, with the, the kind of action that you were describing here, have you been able to attract new conservative members? We're a very small and new chapter. I don't, we haven't gained any members specifically from conservative outreach. Uh, however, identifying people with conservative views in our new membership is something that we've been able to do. Uh, of our active members, which we've got less than 10, uh, two of us are in the conservative caucus. So we're above the national average. <laughs> <laughs> Double. Yeah. Um, I am really having a hard time struggling with where we are in CCL at this historic moment. We are um, we are very proud of the work we've done in growing the bipartisan climate solutions caucus. We hear noise that we're going to have a bill, and I am not sure what that bill is going to be. And I have a challenge for the conservative caucus is whether that bill that that is likely going to come out with Republican authorship is going to be substantial enough to do what we know it needs to do. And I don't have an answer for that, but I'm very much struggling with how we fashion robust legislative, robust, not Effective. just a bill, but whether the bill is enough 
to make a difference. And one of the reasons Marty has often said we need a, a dividend is because if we have a robust price, it will affect lots of people's lives. And that's one of the concerns I have about the pride we take in the numbers of conservatives that are now on the caucus. Do you have any thoughts about that? <coughs> yeah, that's a fantastic point. I think it's uh, pretty openly known within CCL that we have little direct influence on what the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus is actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We like to show the numbers, but it's not like we're showing up in the meetings and setting the agendas. In my mind, the milestone of having a Republican-sponsored climate change bill by itself, even if it's not good enough, is still a huge milestone. In the Conservative Caucus, we're planning for tabling of the bill. And we're planning for what sort of outreach we're going to be doing when that happens. Outreach includes in our own networks, our own local networks of con conservatives in whatever cities we happen to live in, reaching out to them and saying, hey, this is something that we need to get behind. It means writing op-eds for local newspapers from a conservative point of view, saying, yes, this is the solution that, we're, that we've been waiting for. Once a bill is out there, there's going to be a whole bunch of debate on it. It's going to evolve in all sorts of ways. I hope it'll be good enough. If it's not, then the battle will continue. But, uh, yeah, it's something that we've been thinking about and planning on and how to support uh, our conservative members of Congress when this comes out. Try to push it in the right way. Any more? Uh, yeah, it, <clears throat> it's a recommendation, really, as a resource. and it's mm -hmm. So I think all of you probably know who Van Jones is or heard of Van Jones or seen him on mm -hmm. CNN. I'm in love with him. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> he's an easy guy to love. Um, so he's written a book recently called Beyond the Messy Truth. So I guess his show is called The Messy Truth. And he tries to bring conservative and liberal people together and have a discussion, not shouting at each other. But So his whole purpose in the book is how you find common ground with people who are politically on the other side from you. And, I mean, Stan Jones is a longtime liberal activist. He's a progressive. He doesn't make any bones about it. But he said, he says in the book, and he explains how he does this, it's really valuable, how to reach out. And he works with Newt Gingrich. He works with the Koch brothers on prison reform. And he said, we may disagree on nine out of ten issues, but I'll find the one issue we agree on and we'll work on it together. And climate change can be an issue that, you know, you can disagree with practically everything that you can agree on that you can work together. But it's a terrific book. Um, I'm not, it came out a few months ago. It's still on Amazon. You can get it. Hopefully it's in your local bookstore. But anyway, highly recommend it if you haven't read it. And it really is very instructive. It teaches you a lot about how to do this, how to reach out to people who are on the other side of the political spectrum. It would work both ways. He happens to be from a liberal perspective. but. So, and he says, you know, we can't solve problems by going like this <laughs> forever. We've got to figure out how to go like that and get things done. So, it's really good. Thanks. I highly recommend it. And I also wanted to um, remind you if you if there's for some resources that you might need um, from a regional perspective or some regional collaboration, um, let me know. Um, I'm doing a breakout session the last. Um, session of the of the day that's about cross chapter collaboration, regional team assistance. So if you while we're having this conversation, if there's anything you think would be valuable, let me know. Uh, and I'll put it up on our recommendation list here. I just I just have a question because I mean I do think we have to be prepared to, to talk across difference and to listen. But you know when you think about making the and there's the great middle, right? I mean there's the great middle where we're going to bump into Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. in so many organizations. But when we talk about consciously reaching to a conservative base or consciously reaching to a, a liberal base, um, I think kind should work with kind. I mean, you know, and, and then we meet in the middle on the policy. But so I, to me, the, that's, I just, I feel that there's the, you know, again, the great middle where we meet people across the political spectrum and all the different civic groups and organizations we work with. But there's, an, there's a case for us doing that, as well as having these intentional strategies, both on the right and on the left, yeah. to build the relationships 
as Matthew's saying, for um, authentic relationships that will support us in the law in, in getting the bill we want. So. Um, oh, let me, go you ahead. raised your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, Marty, because you said, I think I understood what you meant, but I want to make sure. You said that um, we can actually do better CCL work if we also work with groups like the No Coal group. And so did you mean that we're kind of getting them, um, making a um, good relationship with them, so then they will support us when we get a bill, or was there more? I think so. I think there's some tension in the climate movement right. with the fact that CCL's origins were very aloof. We're only in our lane. We can't give you anything. <laughs> support us, but we can't support you, you know, because we're nonpartisan and we just do this, sorry. And that really didn't make a lot of people happy, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my chapter has endorsed you No know, Coal in Oakland. We've endorsed SB 100 here in the state of California, the letter that was sent to Jerry Brown. We have criteria for endorsements at the chapter level. Um, and we use endorsements and alliance building as an intentional way. It doesn't mean we have to spend a lot of time doing it. Um, it's up to each individual chapter member what they actually want to give in terms of money or human time. But the fact that we will, we will show that we agree with you and we think the work you're doing is important and we mm -hmm. will support it is, is a way to be reciprocal, mm -hmm. you know. Otherwise, we, we, otherwise it's just like want my, my, we support us, but we can't touch you because, you know, we only have this one lane. So that's kind of what I meant that I think we can go farther in our lane <coughs> paradoxically if we're willing to do some of our work outside of it. There's a question in the middle here. For I had more of an experience. Yeah. So uh, with progressive um, groups in our area, we had one in particular that was had a lot of friction with for some reason that none of us really understood why. But um, we think it maybe had to do with that CCL in some way was advocating for a solution to climate change. In a lot of environmental groups, they have many different solutions. So this idea of there being one solution was something. So we've tried to change some of our messaging to be around, this is one approach. It's a very broad idea. There's still a lot of frontline work to be done. So that's a little bit of a shift there. And then another thing I wanted to share is that we've tried to incorporate this group and other groups into our work directly. So, you know, I, I put on a, a small night of presentations recently, and um, I invited a member of this group to speak at that as just an equal mm -hmm. person speaking on whatever they were, you know. Um, That's a great example. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're trying to, and part of a film series I'm putting on where you have time for speakers at that, so I'm going to be bringing in people from other organizations. Um, I think that's, that's a way to... Um, some, you know, a bit of intentional strategy to build those relationships you can do in the normal flow of CCL work. Mm -hmm. um, back to one of your earlier points. Do you have a theory or are you, are you aware of a theory on why CCL doesn't appeal to uh, people of color? Or why, why we haven't made any inroads there yet? Uh, on the other hand, you know, when I went, first went to the climate march last year, I was concern that there weren't any young people there at the climate march, none. Uh, I'm really happy to see a lot of young people today. We've made huge, strides, huge strides there. Mm -hmm. So on the, on the age thing, I think there's, there's kind of a breakthrough happening that looks mm -hmm. good to me. But not, not You know, I'll just say, if you, if you Google around, you'll see that Big Green, a number of years ago, made, realized that they were missing the boat mm -hmm. on being more representative of um, diversity um, beyond having a bunch of whites in Sierra Club and NRDC and EDF and so they had really strong diversity initiative. It seems like maybe we're starting one mm -hmm. but um, and then now Big Green really has gone beyond that and most Big Green organizations put equity at the center so they've now actually joined hands with environmental justice groups and saying yes we agree with you any climate solution has to be equitable at the center. It has to be concerned about those people Robin was talking about that are being harmed now and are going to be harmed the most as we go forward. So um, we haven't chosen to focus on that. And I think what white people forget, I forget, is that we, we have the privilege of not having to pay attention as to who's in the room. Mm -hmm. And we can just build our organizations and just keep doing what we do. And we are the main culture, but we're not the only culture in our world. So whether we're open and friendly or inviting at all to
to people from different ethnic or racial subcultures is something we have to look at. Yeah, well, to that point, I think we kind of take our success in that area for granted. And we ha we are privileged to be successful regardless of what we think about race. So that's, that's a really good point. Thank you. I know in the San Francisco chapter, we are trying to be more conscious during our event planning and tabling sessions of where we are because we've noticed that when we go to a lot of farmers markets, we're going to get a lot of the same people that we're already engaging. So we're trying to be more cognizant of where we are to meet both um, diverse groups of people, whether it be people of color or people on the, in the conservative caucus, for example. Or like We're trying to be more conscious of where we are because that's the people that we meet. So. And I'll make a plug for, um, for Marty's um, breakout session about the dividend because I think you know, as far as the socioeconomic, socioeconomic diversity, it is hard to talk to people whose main concern is a paycheck. And this is pretty abstract um, for folks who are struggling. And the idea of the dividend being a very progressive, it was interesting, I thought that Tom Stevenson uh, really made the point that, the, that he's in support of a progressive return of the dividend. And I think that could be a pretty big winner with people at a you know, different socioeconomic level than probably a lot of us in the room. And this is, I'm hosting Peter Barnes, who's really Sorry, and going yes. to talk about dividends. Not They're going to be talking so. about, yeah, the dividend, and she has a wonderful uh, author. Yeah. Yeah. I had a question about uh, sort of conservative resources, because clearly all people look for pe people that they trust, names that they trust, mm -hmm. <coughs> of which there are fewer in the conservative movement. Clearly people like Schultz is a respected name and some of the people around there. Who are some others? Like is the Niskanen Center still around? Uh, is it known in the conservative movement? Are they promoting? Jeez, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can speak that well on, on this question. What we do have in the conservative caucus is we have our own community website on the community CCL page. And that has a lot of, a lot of resources on it. Anyone can go visit that website and you can see some of the resources. Some of them are labeled that they're for the caucus only. And the reason why that's done is that uh, we're, we're using that to, to sort of enforce the idea that a lot of the messaging to conservative groups should come from conservatives within CCL. Mm -hmm. But I encourage everyone to go and visit uh, our community website and see some of the resources that are available there. And Marty, I think there's an environmental justice out. Um, is, that, is that active on community? Yeah, we still have, don't have our parallel community website, which we want to have this landing page in the, in the CCL website. But in the, there's the, both there's the progressive action team and the environmental justice action team. And if you go in the buddy drives, you know, if you join the, if you join the group and go in the buddy drives, there's information in What's both of What's a buddy those. drive? It's a, it's a tool in CCL community. So CCL community hosts all of our little action teams. And if you join an action team on the left, you'll see this thing called Buddy Drive. And if you click on that, it'll open you up to documents that are resources. About. It's more than we can get into here. Yeah. But, um, Nuts and bolts of community or uh, Yeah, it's really getting to know how to use our community Does platform. it mean that a conservative and a liberal are buddies, they hold hands and they go it's to just No, Buddy Drive is just an internal <laughs> lingo for our community the website. It's a folder. It's a folder. It's, a folder. it's, a folder. it's, a folder. it's called a Buddy Drive, but it's really just a folder. <laughs> with a whole bunch of with resources in it. Yeah, well, thank you very drive. much for everybody's um, participation.